Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Lisa Song Sutton! Thank you. Wow, good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Song Sutton, and it's absolutely amazing to be here. It is one of those things where when you come together and you bring everyone together, that is when the magic happens. So I'm super excited to be kicking this off with you guys. So let's chat real estate investing. I wanna show you an example, a, a personal case study of how you can take one single family home and turn it into a real estate portfolio worth over $60 million. I'm Lisa Song Sutton, attorney turned entrepreneur based here in Las Vegas. I started my business career working in business litigation and business bankruptcy. It was a great precursor to get into business, but most importantly, I used that good W-2 job, that W-2 salary, to help me leverage myself into real estate investing and also diversifying my business portfolio. I started real estate investing in 2011. I opened my first company in 2012. Meanwhile, I was still working full time at a law firm. I worked five and a half days a week at the firm and then nights and weekends, I was working on those side hustles, I was partnering with people, I was putting my money to work for me. This is just an example of some of the brands that I've either founded or co-founded here in the Valley. And now we all joke, it's taken me 13 years to become an overnight success. But my business portfolio is diversified. I have everything from real estate brokerage to food and beverage to e-commerce. If some of you have seen the ship store mini mailbox episode with Ryan, there's been a lot of that and that's been a lot of fun. It's all about diversification for me personally. That is my personal investment thesis and I'll show you how you guys can decide on your own investment thesis as well. I've also been featured in various business publications and I now write for many of them. The reason I bring that up is because we are so lucky to live in a time where you have all of the information available to you at your fingertips. We have content, you have social media, certain, certainly YouTube, but you also have so much good content that's out there with publications, maybe from people you've heard of and maybe from people you've never heard of, but they're still out there building, growing, doing, and you get a chance to learn from any of them as long as you're consuming that information. So the first case study I wanna share with you actually is a personal one. Uh, this is a picture of my parents. Uh, it's one of my favorite photos of them. It's from their early days of when they first started dating. They met in South Korea. My father was a mil career military man, worked uh, 20 years for the United States Air Force, served in the Vietnam War, and then he worked another 20 years for the Department of Defense down in Fort Huachuca, which is where I grew up. My mom was a stay-at-home mom with me until I was about sixth grade, and then she went and got her cosmetology license and opened a hair salon, which to this day she still owns and operates. So with a W-2 government salary and W-2 government salary and with a hair salon, my parents were able to amass a very impressive real estate portfolio simply in one generation and I took that blueprint and did it myself. So how did they get started? This is an example of one of the multifamily properties that they ended up purchasing and when they purchased it in 1999, it was $3.9 million just last year it appraised for over $14 million. That is one property, right? And again, it was done on a W-2 salary and a kind of normal, um, a, a normal business, a hair salon business where my mom has uh, people who work there and she also has her own practice of doing other people's hair. So this is not like a multi-million dollar small business, it's just a, a normal mom and pop shop. So when I was growing up, we owned the home that I lived in, that we grew up in, or that I grew up in. But when I was in elementary school, my parents purchased another single family home, one single family home for $165,000. And then they put a long-term tenant in that. And then they bought another property, putting 20% down and put a long-term tenant in that. And the goal with that was for the long-term tenant to cover the mortgage cover the mortgage and the insurance. Not that they were peeling off money to use for income, because they had income that was coming in, especially from my dad's job. So how were they able to utilize one single family home into a down payment on a $3.9 million multifamily property? Again, starting with just one. 
by the time I was in middle school, they sold the SFRs and they put down a payment on a vacant commercial building that was just off the main drag down in Arizona. And it was a value-add property, so there was no tenant and it needed improvements to be done. They took out a loan to improve the property and they found a long-term tenant. It was a gymnastics company that was uh, teaching kids gymnastics and they signed a three-year lease with them on that. As soon as that was signed and the improvements were done, all of a sudden the property became more valuable. So they held on to that, showed the rent was being paid every single month. And the, by the time I, I was in high school, they sold that one building and they were able to put down the payment, down payment onto that first multifamily property. Again, that was a value add property. They gated it, so they turned it into a gated community, right? They, they paid to put a gate around it. They uh, redid the pool. They installed a children's playground. They increased the rents and they also increased the occupancy. And that was over, over four years. It wasn't overnight. Um, what they did was they took any profit that they possibly could and just stuck it right back into the business because again, they were living off of that W-2 salary and my mom's hair business. By the time I got into college and grad school, my parents refinanced that and then used that money to consistently continue to buy and diversify themselves into real estate and other business endeavors. So I took that same blueprint. I started buying in 2011 here in Las Vegas. And this is a first page of that inspection report from the first property that I bought in Summerlin. Um, 98 bucks a foot, I wish we could go back to that. But this was in Summerlin. I knew that this was a place that I just personally wanted to live. At the time I lived on the Strip, because I'd moved from Florida. Um, I lived right on the Strip here in Las Vegas Boulevard, and I was like, I want to be out in the suburbs. I want to do like the house thing. And I purchased a property out in Summerlin in 2011. I lived in that house for four years, and then I kept it as a rental to rent out. While I lived there, I also was able to utilize, again, my good W-2 job to not only qualify for this property with an FHA loan, I put 3.5% down. I got to that house with $9,500. And I then was able to purchase and keep purchasing. I had a real estate mentor tell me in 2013, Lisa, you need to be buying at least one property a year. And I was like, okay, I'll get right on that. And he was like, seriously. He was like, number one, stop buying the clothes and shoes. And I was like, darn it. But he said, number two, think about this. He's like, I'm talking 20%. When you think about, oh, I need to go buy a piece of property, he's like, all you're seeing is that giant list price. You don't have to come up with the cash for the whole list price. You need to come up with 20%. And then you need to make sure that by doing an analysis that your tenant is going to cover your expenses on that property. So net net, it shouldn't cost you anything. But meanwhile, you're also not peeling off any income from it. Lisa, you already have a job. And in fact, by that time, I had multiple jobs because I had started the cupcakes and other things. So he was like, you don't need that money to live on, but you do need it to build wealth and build assets that you're later going to leverage. So I took that advice and saved my pennies, and I had a goal of saving 20% every year to purchase a property. In 2015, I started buying condo tell units here in Las Vegas. We're really lucky here in Las Vegas, we have this unique asset class called condo tells. And there's a handful of buildings that are zoned as condo tells here in Vegas. Palms Place, MGM Signature, Vidara, and Trump International. And with these properties, they operate like a hotel and they're already zoned as short-term rental. This is before Airbnb was just kind of starting out, this is before certainly all the crazy regulations, which the state legislature seems to change every other year. The nice thing with condo tiles is that the whole building itself is already zoned as short term. So you're able to utilize those properties as an Airbnb and have those cash flow. In 2015, I was buying units in Palms Place Studios for $115,000, $118,000. And my ROI on those was shocking for me. And I realized, okay, this is gonna be a really unique asset class that we need to keep leveraging because anytime that the strip is busy, in general, your condo tell unit is busy. The only time those condos lost money was during the pandemic, those 90 days when our previous governor totally closed the strip, that was the only time. In 2018, I did what's called a portfolio loan. 
Again, work with a lender that knows what they're doing. They know how to work with investors. They can put you into what's called a portfolio loan. That's where you take five or more of your investment properties, not a home that you personally live in, but five or more investment properties, and you can do a refinance where you can pull out that equity that's been accumulated, and then you end up with one payment, which is nice, and you're able to utilize that cash, again, to put down, whether it's down payment on real estate, whether it's diversifying your business interests, you're making that money go to work for you instead of having it tied up in a property. Pro tip, work with an agent that's also an investor. I highly recommend utilizing a real estate agent, whether you are buying commercial or residential, simply because they have a fiduciary duty, they have a contractual obligation to protect your best interests. And when you're on the buy side, you actually are not paying their commission, the other side is. So you have every opportunity to utilize someone who has your best interest and has a fiduciary duty to protect your interests. Again, work with an agent that also is a real estate investor, and you can simply ask them, how many properties do you own? Where do you invest? What areas of town do you like to invest in? And if they say that they don't own any investment properties, I would suggest finding someone who does because one, they're gonna ask different questions, two, they're gonna have different criteria, and three, they're, they're, they are going to negotiate differently on your behalf because they know the process, they've been through it. So simply decide on your strategy, right? I like to take a long-term approach where I'm using real estate to build net worth and assets that I can then pull cash from to diversify into other business interests. Define your goals. This is a photo of my dad and I. Um, we were very close. He passed in 2020 and I miss him every day. One of our favorite pastimes was going out to car shows and being part of car groups. And I bring this up because it should help you define your goals. There's a great book, you can find it on Amazon, it's a little thin green book called Values-Based Financial Planning. And there's a great exercise in it where you get out a piece of paper and you write down the word money on the bottom piece of the paper. And you ask yourself, why is money important to me? For me, I wrote flexibility. And then you ask yourself again, why is flexibility important to me? I wrote freedom. Why is freedom important to me? I wrote spending time with family. Why is spending time with family important to me? And you go through this exercise like 15 times. You keep asking yourself, why is blank important to me? And then you end up with this entire page of values, of a list of values of things that are important to you. And that truly will help you define your goals. Next, invest in yourself and your education. Invest in time to learn about real estate. You guys are already doing that here by attending things like this, by being part of those masterminds and those groups and attending these in-person conferences. I can't tell you how much my life has changed by investing in myself and my education. I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on coaching, mentorship, attending seminars like this, and reading as much as I possibly can. You could get designations like your real estate license. Um, I think there's, there's something really clean about having a real estate license as an investor, even though you may not do your own deals. Even though I'm an experienced real estate investor, I actually own a real estate brokerage, I don't run the deal myself. I always have an agent running the deal for me. One, it provides a barrier and a bit of a cushion, but two, I want a second set of experienced eyes on this because when you are the investor, I know it's numbers and we say it's not emotional. When you're the investor, sometimes you can get caught up. It's happened to me. I like to have that buffer of someone else who has a fiduciary duty who's looking out for my best interests. Read those books, take those online courses, attend the conferences, and get the coaching and mentorship. I just included a little quick list of some of the resources that have helped me along my journey. Certainly Rich Dad Poor Dad, who doesn't know Robert Kiyosaki, right? I have that old dog-eared copy of Rich Dad Poor Dad from college, and I've kept it ever since. ABCs of Real Estate Investing, it's written by one of my real estate mentors, Ken McElroy. It's a really great tactical book. Again, you can probably just find it on Amazon. Certainly Wealth Without Cash, Pace Morby. If you guys don't follow him on Instagram, he's incredible. Um, and I love his approach on the creative finance because especially now in a time with high interest rates, it is so incredible to watch them do the deals that they're doing. I personally haven't done one yet, but I'm excited to in the future for sure. Bigger Pockets, I've followed their podcast for a long, long time. They have great resources and their IG is also really, really good. 
conferences like this. And there's another great conference that Ken, my real estate mentor, puts on called Limitless that I also go to every year. Um, it's, it's a room like this where your speakers on stage are people who are experts in that particular topic that they're talking about, and you get a chance to work with other real estate investors or people who are trying to get into real estate investing that are in the audience that you build a connection with during the time that you're there. I would recommend meeting with your mentor at least once a quarter. That's what I do, that's my cadence. We'll meet in person if we can, otherwise it's a Zoom. And just having that level of accountability from someone else, someone who's not your significant other or your business partner or your parent or your friend, having that accountability from somebody else in your life is a game changer. Network, say yes to everything. I'm a former Miss Nevada. Um, during that time, I did nearly 500 community appearances, volunteering in schools, reading in hospitals, working with countless nonprofits. And to this day, now nine years later, I still have business relationships, personal relationships, connections, resources from that time that I was literally out volunteering within the community. We have an incredible network of nonprofits, especially here in Las Vegas, but certainly wherever you live, if you're visiting, wherever you live, there's going to be some sort of nonprofit that resonates with you. And it doesn't have to be like a heavy, you know, you're dealing with like domestic violence or something, which is all like very important and it's needed for the advocacy. But one of my favorite charities to volunteer with is the Nevada SPCA. They're our state's largest no-kill shelter. And you literally are volunteering by going to play with puppies and walking dogs. So you can make it your own time of whatever resonates with you. Just remember that you can start small. It's okay to lay a foundation and start small. I think especially with this age of social media, it's easy to get caught up, right? And you see those stories of people who are like, six months ago I was sleeping on my mom's couch and now here's my Lamborghini from all of my Airbnb investing. I don't know how real all of that stuff is, but I can tell you from experience, it takes time, you're gonna make some mistakes, but if you start small and do it in a risk mitigated way, again, perhaps just by leveraging your W-2 job to qualify for that first real estate investment property, you can do it in a way where even on the L's, on the losses, it's not gonna be catastrophic. My, one of my real estate partners, Kathy, she started with the house hacking method. That's how she started her real estate portfolio here. She bought a house, a four bedroom house back in like 2014, and it was in a new build community in, um, off of Spring Mountain, right in Chinatown here in Las Vegas. And at the time, she was just a, a single young woman, and she bought this giant four bedroom property and she rented out the three other bedrooms to girlfriends of hers. And I think they paid her around 600 bucks a month, all inclusive. And um, with that, she was able to pay for her mortgage and pay for her HOA fee. And that was her first opportunity to get into the real estate investing side of one, just knowing what it's like to be a landlord. There's certainly a learning curve there. And then two, realizing that this property that she used to think of as a liability, you're gonna pay for somewhere to live anyway. Now, all of a sudden, it has become an asset. And she lived in that property for, I think, just a little over two years, and then bought another property and kept that one as a rental, started house hacking the new property that she bought, and so on and so forth. You could JV with an investor. JV is joint venture. You could joint venture with an investor. Maybe you only have, let's say, 10 grand, right? And you're like, I've saved this $10,000. I wanna figure out what I can do with my money. First, I think investing in yourself is the most important thing. But after that, if you're like, look, I have some funds that I wanna utilize, I wanna get into real estate investing, how can I do it? It just seems like the barrier's so high. It's actually not. You can absolutely joint venture with an investor. You may even meet someone that you end up partnering with here at things like this, where you get a chance to meet in person, you learn about what they're working on, you learn about the deals that are coming across their desk, and you might have a chance to contribute in. And that is going to be your first taste and your first entryway into it. Go train for a period of time, right? Do a mentorship or even go get a job. Um, <laughs> I did this uh, with my shipping stores. I didn't know anything about the industry, but I knew that I was so intrigued by the business model and I felt confident enough that I would be able to figure it out. So I paid a mentor $10,000 to let me come work in his store for two weeks. 
and I captured all of his processes and then modified and built my stores after that. So sometimes you just need to go out and get a mentorship, get a job, pay into something perhaps so that you can get that hands-on training and learn and then implement it yourself. Surround yourself with support and inspiration. Cut out the haters and negativity. I know it's always easier said than done, but this is one of those things where if you're here and you're serious about investing in yourself and investing in your future, and again, that, that values-based financial planning, right, of like what's important to you, why are you doing all this in the first place, one of the best things and I think easiest things you can do is just cut out the haters. If you have someone in your life who like always complains, or like, are they always blaming someone else for their own shitty situations? There has to come a point where you say, this is not for me. And when you change that environment and you change who's around you, all of a sudden you're like, I'm getting lucky. Like cool things are happening, good things are happening. That's a real tangible thing and a real result that It or have done it the longest or be the most established in the room. But if you bring the work ethic and you show that 100%, it will come back to you many fold. You can find me on social at Lisa Song Sutton and I'll be around tonight at the penthouse party. I look forward to meeting all of you and thank you so much for being here.